Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Classes of Mail. My name is Alan Gigax, and today we're going to talk about a subject very near and dear to my heart, and that is management. Well, management is not near to my heart. Uh, the mistreatment of carriers by management, that is what is near to my heart. And I'll probably get a little bit fired up on this one, so be forewarned. There may be a few naughty words here and there, so if that uh, bothers your ears, you may want to skip this episode or just buckle down. So, here we go. Management, supervisors, they're assholes. Every single one of them. Assholes. All right, that's not actually true. In fact, at my station at East Las Vegas, I have an excellent supervisor. So I just want to get that out of the way right now in uh, interest of disclosure. Uh, I have it easy because we have one supervisor who is really exceptional. She's competent. She's fair. She treats people like human beings. She's reliable. And she's the person who holds the station together. And thank God she's the one who sets the tone at our station. And it's one of the reasons I've stayed at this station for a very long time. She is truly exceptional. And that's probably the most defining thing is how exceptional she is, especially at the post office. Honestly, she's probably the best supervisor I've had at any job let alone the post office. So we acknowledge that. We acknowledge that there are exceptions and that every supervisor and manager and whatever and postmaster is a unique individual. They're all different. But let's also acknowledge that there are consistent problems across the country. And that's what we're going to talk about today is the way management mistreats carriers and the consistent problems that we're having everywhere across the country. And I'm going to go through a little laundry list right now. And then we're going to get into, I'm already talking too fast. We're going to get into some of these in greater detail. So you guys know what it is. You've experienced it. They are riding carriers to go faster, always faster, faster, faster. That is the number one point of pressure. They give carriers pressure over stationary events. Oh, what were you doing sitting at this one spot for 12 minutes? And they just ride you on it. Oh, you can't be sitting still. You got to move, move, move. Meanwhile, they sit still on their ass behind that desk all day long. They put pressure on you for your attendance standards. We get a benefit of sick leave. We earned that benefit. And then they want to give us a hard time for using it. They put emotional pressure on carriers to rush the route. You know, they try to peer pressure you or talk about your commitments and, and standards and things like that to get you to rush on the route. Management falsifies your records, your training records, including heat training, which mine personally is one of the falsified records. I did eventually get that heat training, but it shows that I got it way before it actually happened. And that's bullshit. Management needs to be giving us that training. And training is... Is this whole bigger topic? Let me just continue this list. Management fights carriers about their overtime, about the time that they use. They fight over the 3996. They call us fucking liars over the time that we're putting in. They're saying that we're stealing time because we need 30 minutes on our 3996. They verbally abuse carriers. They talk shit. They say things that are hurtful to carriers. We had a, a CCA at our station came back from the street one day and the supervisor left a notice of resignation on her case for her to fill out. It's, it's chicken shit. We have this problem nationwide of not hiring enough people. Right? Obviously, we're short staff. We're short staff everywhere. We're short staff so bad that in some places, whole routes don't go out for days at a time. And then the few people we do get to come in and start working at the post office, management runs them off. We've got the problem of improper mandating. Car managers are just mandating whoever is convenient. And they're giving excessive, um, they're mandating too often, they're mandating the wrong people, all this stuff. You know, we're supposed to be able to control how much overtime we want, at least once you make regular. And that's just not happening. Management just doesn't give a shit. They're trying to intimidate carriers with excessive office counts, uh, 1838C, where they stand behind you and count your mail and watch you case. What do they even do with those numbers? <laughs> Shoot, my phone's ringing. Uh, let me pause this, and uh, then I will keep going. There we go, like it never happened. Boy, you'd think a real professional would just silence his phone. 
But uh, I ain't getting paid for this, so tough luck. So anyway, the um, the office counts and the street counts, the 3999s where they follow you out on the street. For what purpose? Right? They have to do that from time to time. Well, I'm going to get into it. And then generally just ignoring the contract. Both parties agreed to this contract. It's not like the NALC just came up with this document. Oh, we'll get you here. Both parties agreed to this in these long-ass negotiations. So I'm going to go over all of these topics. And I'm going to tell you how to defend against them. How to protect yourself from management mistreatment. And the overarching theme here, knowledge is power. The training at the post office is shit. And I say that as a former Carrier Academy instructor. Uh, things are going well on that front, and it's starting to look like I will be back in the Academy soon. Once that all shapes up, I'll tell you the story. Uh, and I'm also an on-the-job instructor and have been for many years. And the Academy is good. I like the Academy. Uh, we do a decent job with on-the-job training as well. But that's like two weeks at the start of your career. And then you know when you get the next intensive training after that? Never. There is no training for the rest of your career. You might get an occasional stand-up talk, or if you get in a vehicle accident, there's going to be refresher uh, driver training. But that's it. All this other stuff that you're supposed to remember. I mean, we got a four-day carrier academy, and it's just non-stop PowerPoint slides. There is so much information. And once that's over, you get to your station, you get your three days of on the job, and again, you're learning new skills all the time. You're learning the physical skills, and then after that, that's it. It's not reinforced. All you hear after that for management is faster, faster, faster. There's no nurturing. There's no making sure that you're doing the job the right way. There's just make sure you go faster. So what's the story with this lack of training, with this dearth of continued training? Well, the way I see it, there's two possible reasons for it. Reason number one, malice. Straight malice. Management wants us stupid so they can abuse us. The less we know, the easier we are to control. If we don't know what our contractual rights are, we're less likely to try to enforce them. If we don't know what the real standards are, then we can't push back when management gives us bullshit standards. And so the stupider we are, the better it is for management because they can just walk all over us. So that's potential reason number one, malice. Potential reason number two is their own incompetence because they don't seem to realize the value of training. You know, they're so short-sighted that they don't want to spend like two hours on a carrier for a refresher training that would save them who knows how many hours on the back end of fewer problems, more efficient delivery, less customer complaints, less mistakes, all this stuff on the back end. But they're like, no, I can't spare two hours today. It's a busy day. Yeah, well, every fucking day is busy. Every day is like that. And it ain't going to get better unless we address this shit. But... The more, man, the more carriers are ignorant and ill-informed, management just continue to walk all over us. So there is a philosophical concept called Hanlon's Razor. And Hanlon, Hanlon's Razor says this, Never attribute to malice that which is adequately explained by stupidity. And the reality is that the malice explanation where they want to keep us dumb so they can control us, it gives management too much credit. I think it's a lot more likely that they just don't see the benefit of training because they're so desperate to cover their two hours today that they don't bother putting in any investments to make things better for the future. And then there's probably a little bit on the back door of that, well, I don't want carriers you know, being able to stand up to me. There's at least some of that in there. So we'll get into these issues, issues and I'm going to fight that shit with education. So a lot of these things that are in that big list I gave at the beginning are about time and speed. So I'm going to address those things as a group. First thing I want to say to you guys, there is no speed standard for street delivery. There is no speed standard. I have been on a route inspection where the guy who's following me says, you know, you're supposed to take 60 paces per minute and you're only taking 47. Bullshit. There's no code that says I have to take 60 paces per minute. We're all different. We all walk at different paces. The ground conditions are different. How could they possibly tell me how fast I'm supposed to walk? And this shit has been settled in grievance after grievance after grievance. And there's no fucking way management doesn't know that that's the rule. Forget it. They know. 
And they're trying to bullshit you. They're trying to get one over on you. They're trying to take advantage of you. There is no speed standard for street delivery. You'll hear it from the union again and again because it's true. It takes what it takes. Management will try to intimidate you. They may even try to discipline you for taking too long on the street, but that shit ain't going to hold up. Because in order to actually discipline you for taking too long, they have to demonstrate that you were actually engaging in time-wasting practices or that you put forth unsatisfactory effort. And in order to do either of those things, they'd have to get off their fucking asses and get out from behind the desk and actually go out on the street. So instead, they rely on scanner data. Your scanner cannot demonstrate either of those two things. Your scanner can't say that you were giving unsatisfactory effort. Is there a chart on your scanner that says how hard you're trying? No, there isn't. They can't, this scanner can't prove time-wasting practices. It can say that the scanner itself was stationary for eight minutes. What does that mean? What were you doing in those times? Maybe you were reorganizing your mail. Maybe you were doing something productive. Maybe you were trying to recover physically from the demands of the job. Maybe from the heat. You get time to recover from heat. Maybe you were being a team player, think you were a team player, and you were in the back of the truck taking a shit into a bucket so that you could save time on a comfort stop in order to help management make their goals. So the scanner was stationary during that. Oh, by the way, here's a pro tip. Uh, buckets are really good at holding mail. They're excellent buckets. They're just the right size. They have great handles. They hold mail really well. But they are bad at containing things that are liquid or semi-liquid. Uh, I have that on good authority from a friend. So when you have to take comfort stops, don't rely on a bucket that you're going to have to wind up throwing in the dumpster. Go to the bathroom. So management will never explicitly tell you to skip your breaks or to skip your lunch. Management will never tell you to take shortcuts on safety. They'll never tell you, oh, you know what, to go a little faster, just don't buckle your seatbelt or leave the door open or shit like that. They're not going to tell you that. They're not going to tell you explicitly to, <laughs> where did I? Uh, oh, here we go. They're not going to tell you to hide the mail. They're not going to tell you, oh, instead of delivering those ads, just leave them in the back of your truck. At tonight's union meeting, there was talk about a carry who got fired for doing exactly that. He left his ads in the back of the truck. He was hiding mail, delaying the mail. Management's never going to tell you to pee in a bottle in the back of the truck instead of going to the bathroom. They're not going to tell you to skip deliveries or falsify your scans or, or any of the shit that carriers do that get them in trouble. And if management ever does tell you to do those things, for God's sake, write a statement. Write down what management told you. Though you're not going to believe this. They actually told me, don't bother shutting off the truck when I get out of it, and I can save a few seconds that way. Heaven forbid they ever say that. For God's sake, write a statement. Give it to your union steward. But in general, management is never going to explicitly tell you to do those things. Instead, what management does is they just put pressure on carriers and they lean on you and they give you a hard time and they single you out and they talk shit to you and then the carrier themselves decide to do all these things in order to meet management's bullshit expectations. I cannot tell you how many CCAs I've seen out on the street doing things that I personally trained them not to do and they're like, oh, I'm in a hurry. I'm trying to get this done. Management wants me back by six o'clock. Well, there's your fucking problem. It's management's unrealistic expectations. That is not your problem. That is management's problem. So here's how you protect yourself from that. First line of defense is the 3996. That is your friend. The 3996 is where you tell management honestly how long your day will take you. If you're going to go into overtime, you have an obligation to fill out that 3996. I have a whole episode devoted to it. I think it was my very first episode. And you fill that out and you turn that into management. Because overtime itself doesn't lead to discipline. You don't get discipline just for going into overtime. You get discipline for unauthorized overtime. So you have an obligation to keep management informed. And that's what the 3996 does. Hey, I'm going to need 45 minutes of overtime. Or I'm going to need four hours of overtime. Or whatever it is. And then you put your reasons in box J. And... That's that, and it goes to them. What they do about it is up to them. That is not your problem. 
You have an obligation to keep them informed, but you didn't sign up for that decision-making process. And that was in the last episode. Let, let management make management decisions. That is not your problem. You be honest. And then do the job the right way. Buy the book. Because if management actually comes out and they see you out there cutting corners, they see you, you know, not securing the truck or they see you, you know, doing whatever skipping things, they're not going to come up and pat you on the back and be like, oh, thank you so much for cutting these corners and and really speeding for me. No, they're going to come out and see you doing that crap and they're going to give you discipline. There is no doubt they're going to issue that discipline. You're out here endangering yourself to try to please management, and if they see you doing it, they're going to write you up. They're going to give you a letter of warning. They're going to give you a a suspension. They might fire you for you taking their bullshit expectations and then cutting corners to try to meet them. Don't give them that opportunity. Do the job the right way. And that's also important because if you have consistent conflict with management over these times, you know, they keep saying, oh, I don't think you need that overtime. You're like, well, I do. Your ultimate defense is to invite management to follow you so that you can prove how long the job takes. Guys, it is a really good feeling to know that you're telling the truth about how long that route takes. And if they don't believe you, come out and follow me. See how long it really takes so that you can prove how long the job takes. But in order to do that, you have to actually be able to do the job the right way. Because now if they're going to be watching you all day long and you have bad habits like not curbing your wheels, for example, if it's just something you don't do, you think you're going to suddenly be able to curb the wheels every time you park now that management's watching you? No, these are habits that you have to build. And again, building these positive habits are one of the ways that you can prevent management from fucking with you because you're a dry well. They come out there, they want to fuck with you, they look, you're doing everything right, and they're like, well, that was a waste of time. We didn't catch them doing anything wrong. That's what you want. That's the way it has to be. So you have to do the job every day as if management were following you. You have to do the job right because when they finally do follow you, you better be doing that shit right. And again, this is all part of your defense. You defend against management's bullshit expectations by knowing, hey, I'm doing the job the right way. If they think that it should be done faster, they're full of shit. They're wrong. And if they think they're right, they come out and prove it. And then you're going to prove it. My last route was 45 minutes too long. And it was a fight every fucking day with this one supervisor who, thank God, has since retired. And he would always say, oh, you don't have, you only have your reference mail volume. Why are you taking 45 minutes? Because the route's too fucking long. And, you know, I invited him, come out and follow me. I eventually got followed five different times. And every time the route was exactly what I said it would be within a couple of minutes. And eventually they had to cut my route. It can be that way for you, too. You defend yourself by doing the job the right way. And then the bullshit that management says to you has no effect because you know you got this ace in your pocket of, hey, come out and see me do it. All right, that's speed. There is no speed standard. Have I said that enough times? There is no speed standard. You get in trouble for unauthorized overtime. You get in trouble for unsatisfactory effort. And you get in trouble for time-wasting practices. You do not get in trouble for going too slow. Next, falsification of records. You know, this is not okay. It's bad enough that they don't give us proper training. But then when they're supposed to give us training, then they fucking falsify it. So, oh, yeah, they got that training. And then you know what? They're going to hold you accountable for it. When Mr. Gates died in Texas, you know... If you listen to Aid Arbitration, oh, he's gone off about this plenty, that when the post office released their statement to the press, they touted, oh, we give carriers our heat training. They didn't give Gates his heat training. In fact, they claimed that they gave him his heat training. Now, I don't know this personally. This is what I have heard. Maybe I'm wrong about this, uh, but it's very plausible to me uh, that they falsified his heat training and he wound up dying of heat. They're going to falsify that shit. So how did I find out that they falsified my heat training? Well, I went on a light blue and I checked my hero training profile. And there it says like completed trainings or I don't know where it is well enough to walk you through it now. But if 
you can get on to light blue and check your hero profile, look through there and look and see what training you've completed. And it's pretty safe bet. Well, who knows how things are at your station, but if you find stuff on there that they claim that they train you and you didn't actually get it done, report that to your union. The other fault, the other thing that management falsifies is your clock rings. And guys, this is a major violation. This is the kind of stuff that can get management fired. Does it? Not usually, but it should. So is management falsifying your clock rings? Well, probably not. If you're just doing regular eight hour day and going home, no, that would be a big red flag. Like, Hey, how come my paycheck only shows I work 36 hours this week? But if you go into overtime, and if they're being really tight on overtime, maybe they'll just fudge your hours a little bit to bring you back down so that you didn't get overtime. Especially if you go into penalty overtime, then you're going to want to check that virtual time card on light blue and make sure that your times are in there correctly. And if you see any discrepancies, if you know that I clocked out at 18.75 and it shows that I clocked out at 18.25, that's some bullshit. That means the supervisor changed it. And when they do that, there's a paper trail. Man, or the union can go in there, pull these records, and see that that clock ring was changed. And then, oh, it's on at that point. So you don't put up with that shit. Check your light blue. Check your training records. Check your clock rings. Make sure that shit's right. And if it's not right, you go to your union. And we're going to file on that every time. And, oh, that is a good grievance. All right, the next thing is contract violations. The contract is not intended to be a weapon that the parties used against, against each other. This is something that was mutually agreed to. As this podcast is being recorded, we are in contract negotiations right now. We've been in contract negotiations for a long time. And the reason it takes a long time is because the union and management have to come to an agreement. And that's what that contract record, or represents. It's an agreement between us and management. So we agreed to it. Yes, this sounds good to us. Management said, yes, this sounds good to us. And then management just throws the fucking contract out the window and does whatever they want. And that's some bullshit. So here's some things in the contract that you need to be aware of. If you clock out at the end of your shift and management tells you to clock back in or they tell you to go keep working, you get additional hours guaranteed. I don't remember off the top of my head. It's either two hours or four hours. Or it might depend on your office size. But if they send you out to work for another half hour, you get that guaranteed time. If you clocked out and then they tell you to clock back in and keep working or just tell you to keep working and then clock out again later, you get that guarantee time as if you're starting a new shift. And it's right in the contract. I think it's an article eight. How much time you're guaranteed if that happens. It's real clear. And I guarantee you management knows it. And if they tell you to clock in and then they don't give you that guarantee, they're trying to fuck you. They're doing it on purpose. That is not okay. Do not let them get away with that shit. All right. If they tell you to clear and go, you get back and you're close to the end of the, you know, whatever their cutoff time is. Maybe it's going into penalty, whatever it is. And they're like, hey, don't worry about your, your PM stuff. Just clear and go. Or you only have five minutes of PM office time. Guys. There are controlling documents for how much time we get in the evening. And like everything else, it's not an actual fixed time. It takes what it takes, depending on how much cleanup you have, how many carrier endorsed you have, how much green mail, you know, whatever it is that you have has to be taken care of, including wash up time. You get a reasonable amount of time to wash your hands and get yourself cleaned up because we do dirty work. And dealing with the mail is dirty and you get time to wash up. So if they tell you to clear and go, does that include wash up time? Probably not. They want you to clock out, then go wash your hands. That is not okay. That is a grievance. You are getting screwed out of time that you are owed that they agreed to when they agreed to the contract. You get that time. So if they short you that time, you go to the union and tell them and write a statement. This is what happened. This is what the supervisor told me. And so I was not given time to do X, Y, and Z. At your station, there should also be what's called a city carrier flow chart that lists everything you're supposed to do throughout the day in order, including in the evening, in the office. 
And so there'll be a line item on there that says clock back to the office. And then there'll be like six more things that you're supposed to do before you clock out. So regardless of what bullshit that manager's telling you, that postmaster, whatever, that, oh, you only get five minutes of PM office time and you better be out of here. Well, however long it takes you to do all those things on that checklist, that's how much office time you get in the evening. And just like everything else, they can't discipline, or they can try. They can't discipline you for taking nine minutes in the office in the PM. They can discipline you for time-wasting practices. They can discipline you for unsatisfactory effort. But they can't discipline you for taking nine minutes when they think it should only take you five. That is not going to stand. Don't let them get away with that shit. It takes what it takes. Now, if they tell you to clock out and leave, well, you have to follow their instructions. But again, that's what the grievance process is for so that they don't just get away with it. That is not okay. All right, next. This is specifically for CCAs. This was also a topic of tonight's union meeting. You are a scheduled employee. You are not on call. You are not on call. Management has an obligation to schedule you. The worst thing about being a CCA and the number one reason we lose new CCAs is the schedule. Schedule sucks ass. What time am I working tomorrow? I don't know. What time am I getting off tonight? I don't know. What What's my day off next week? I don't know. And now you're going to sit at home next to your phone waiting for it to ring to see what whether you're coming in that day? No, that's bullshit. And it's covered in the fucking contract, the contract that management agreed to, that you are scheduled. So if you are on the schedule and you show up, you get your guaranteed time. If you're in a small office or small area, it's two hours. In bigger areas, it's four hours. And you get that guaranteed time. And in the contract, it says that if they call you at home and tell you not to come in, well, you're out of luck. But you don't have to answer your phone. You don't have to respond to text messages. You're on the schedule. You show up. You're a scheduled employee. And if you show up and they tell you they don't need you, Hey, that's fine. Make sure you check in with your union steward because you're going to get that guaranteed time. And management knows that you are guaranteed that time. And if they send you home and they try to prevent you from clocking in and then they don't give you that guarantee, they're trying to fuck you. Don't let them get away with it. That is bullshit. They know the fucking rules. They agreed to those fucking rules. In fact, even if you volunteer to go home early, and that totally happens, you know, you came in at, at 9 o'clock, and it turns out there's not much to do today, and so after 11 o'clock, they're like, hey, there's really nothing left to do. Do you want to go home? And you go, yeah, sure, I'll go home. And then they act like they don't have to pay you. No, that's bullshit. It specifically says in the contract that they agreed to that they still have to pay you, that there's only certain circumstances, like a medical emergency, where they wouldn't have to pay you your, your full guarantee. You get that guarantee even if they solicit for volunteers to go home early, which they're not supposed to do. <sighs> More contractual violations. The, the number one is overtime violations. There is a process for assigning overtime. There is a pecking order for certain types of overtime. Like, for example, I have my own route, and I'm on the full overtime desired list, the 12-hour list. So if I have overtime on my own route and my T6 is on work assignment, my T6 is entitled to that overtime. So if you're a T6 on work assignment and these ODL carriers are taking overtime on their own assignment and you're not getting any overtime, that's a grievance. You are the first in the pecking order for that overtime. You get overtime before an ODL carrier gets it on their own route. If you're both on work assignment, then yes, that carrier takes their own overtime. But if they're on the ODL and the T6 is on work assignment, T6 gets it first. <sighs> Management knows that. And guess what? If they don't do it, they're fucking you. All right. There's a pecking order for mandating. If people have to be mandated, you know, management gets a certain amount of leeway. Like there's provisions in the contract that says if it's, you know, inefficient to give that overtime to somebody else, maybe on my route, I only have like 10 minutes of overtime that I'm going to need and maybe I'm eight hours only. 
So in order to give that overtime to somebody else who's on the overtime desired list, that person is 15 minutes away. And so they would have to travel 15 minutes, do my 10 minutes of overtime, and then travel 15 minutes back to their route. It really doesn't make any sense for them to do all that on overtime when all I need is 10 minutes. Management has that flexibility. And they can just mandate me to work that overtime. And there's no penalty for that, at least by my reading of the contract. But even with that flexibility, they still can't get it right. And they still break this shit all the time. So knowing those rules is your ultimate defense. Now, you still have to obey now and grieve later. But Jesus Christ, if you don't know what the rules are and you don't grieve it, they get away with it. They just got away with fucking you. Don't let them get away with that. That's what we have the union for. I'm a, I'm a union steward. That's why I joined the union. So that management would stop getting away with this shit. No. Enough. File that grievance. Know your rights. That's what the... Mm. All right. Next. Regular old harassment. Like excessive office counts and street counts and observations. Now, it's reasonable for management to count your mail from time to time. I don't know why. They have the 1838C, and they count all your mail in the morning, and they watch you case your mail, and what do they do with it? Fuck if I know. I've asked around, and I haven't gotten a good answer to that yet. If you know, uh, send it in to classesofmail at gmail.com, or you can find me on Facebook, Alan Gigax, and uh, let me know what that's actually used for. Um. But I know one of the things that it's used for is making sure that you're meeting the 18 and 8 standards, 18 letters in a minute, 8 flats in a minute. And you do have to meet those standards. That's pretty much the only speed standard in the office. Oh, and there's a certain speed for pulling down, too. I think it's 70 pieces in a minute or something like that. Uh, Whatever it is, right, there is that standard. And they can use the 1838C to help enforce that standard. Uh, But almost everybody meets that standard. That standard is really slow. Especially now that we have very few caseable letters. Eight flats in a minute. Uh, Come on, man. Now, you do get a reasonable amount of time to learn your route. So if you're a CCA or a PTF or an unassigned regular and you bounce from route to route, they can't really hold you to that standard because you haven't been on the route long enough to have it totally memorized. They might try to, but your union should be able to, to undo that because you haven't learned the route yet. So same with street observations, the 3999 or the occasional safety observations. That's something the management really should be doing. I encourage them to do that because that's how they can actually see if carriers are out fucking off and not doing what they're supposed to do. And it's reasonable for management to enforce that. That's part of their job. That That's what any supervisor would and should be doing. But then there are supervisors who do it five days a week three days a week. They bring in teams of supervisors and each day a different supervisor finds the carrier that they feel like picking on and they just keep picking on that carrier. That is harassment. You know, anything more than occasional, maybe once or twice a year, that's harassment and it should be grieved. There's no reason that they have to keep counting your mail. So the number one thing you're going to do when that happens, bring it to the attention of your union steward. Don't... (sighs) Just bring it to the attention of your union steward and they'll file a, a harassment grievance. And this is stuff that's been settled and there's citations and, and this is settled. The other thing you can do is to make it uncomfortable for them. So if they want to count your mail, you have a contractual right to verify that count. So they're going to take all your flats out of your buckets and they're going to count every single one of them. And then when you get on the clock, You're going to take all your flats out of your buckets and you're going to count every single one of them. They're going to count all your parcels. So you're going to count all your parcels. And you know what else they count? Your letters. Not just your caseable letters. They get your DPS count. And they say, oh, you have 2,122 pieces of DPS today. How do you know that's what you have? Well, you better count it to make sure. And that is absolutely your right to count that DPS. And if you start doing that, And so every day you're taking up an additional 15 minutes counting that DPS. Well, that makes it a little more painful for management because they're going to have to pay you for that time to do this completely useless thing because they're just trying to harass you. 
You know, there's other ways you can make it uncomfortable for them too. Like I had a buddy of mine who was getting case observations day after day and he just started farting in his case. And this is a true story. And he just kept farting in his case and eventually the supervisor backed up and then eventually the supervisor just walked away. So that's a win in my book. That's the way to do it. All right, so that's the deal with excessive counts. <sighs> sick leave. So management has a requirement to keep your sick leave under control and to not let carriers use too much sick leave. Um, but there's no firm definition for regular in attendance. What does it mean to be regular in attendance? Well, this is a very subjective term. Management will try to act like their standards and they'll say like, oh, anything more than three absences in three months or who knows what bullshit standard they're going to say. But the, the reality is regular in attendance is a subjective term. And how do you protect yourself against something that's subjective? Well, this is part of what your union is there for. Your union is going to make the argument that this is an earned benefit. And if they give you a benefit and then claim you can't use it, that's bullshit, which it is. So that's one way is to protect yourself on the back end. If they issue discipline, you need good union stewards for that. So there's other ways to protect you as well. Like if you're going to be out sick for more than a couple of days, go to the doctor or now it's easier than ever with telehealth. Just schedule a telehealth appointment. They're usually pretty cheap and you can get a doctor's note that way. And so now you're covered. You have that doctor's note to cover that absence. Another way to get doctors to cover your absence is with FMLA, the Family and Medical Leave Act. And that gives you a lot of protections where leave is concerned. And so if you have one of those covered conditions where you're going to need regular doctor visits or it's an ongoing thing that doesn't respond to treatment, you know, whatever all those criteria are, get that FMLA protection. Oh, my God, is that helpful? So that takes away a big tool of harassment that management uses. You know, you may not always be able to get FMLA. Maybe you don't have one of those covered conditions. But good God, if you do, please use it. And that goes for CCAs too. They can get FMLA protection just like anybody else. And the last thing I'll say on this is um, if you really are abusing your sick leave, then you can expect discipline. Uh, if you call in after every home football game or, you know, some obvious pattern or, or <clears throat> you know, they'll try to say like, oh, you called in in conjunction with days off. But if you have rotating days off or a day off in the middle of the week, it's almost impossible to call in without being in conjunction with a day off. So that doesn't really hold up. Um, but, you know, if you're just calling out because you drank too much on a regular basis, like our union president, then um, you should expect to get disciplined for that. Uh, but other than that, you know, again, you use these, uh, use these strategies to protect yourself. <sighs> Next, this is the last one. And to me, it's the most egregious. And that's verbal abuse where they just talk shit to you and they say things that are mean, that are hurtful, that are inappropriate. This is still a workplace. What workplace would put up with that shit with management just telling you that you suck? No workplace, no reasonable workplace would stand for that. And so what do you do? Well, the first thing you have to do is document that abuse document it, document the abuse. You have to write it down. You have to tell what happened and you have to turn it into your union steward. And then they're going to file a grievance on the joint statement on violence and behavior in the workplace. Or they're going to file a grievance on mutual respect or, or some combination of those things, or, or there's some other things, but they're going to file that grievance. And unfortunately, who, who decides what punishment management is going to get? Who gets to decide that? Management gets to decide that. And so quite often there are no repercussions against management for being assholes. But it's a, it's a slow game. It's a long game. And for the union, we have to build that paper trail. Because eventually when there's five instances and ten instances and who knows how many instances, eventually it can't be ignored anymore. And your incident that happened early on in that paper trail, you know, it might not be real satisfying for you to see that manager get walked out or whatever it is, but somewhere down the road that is going to happen. And your statement is a critical part of building that case. You can't just take that shit and walk away and just eat it. You have to document it. <clears throat> for me, 
at my station, this is one of the hardest things that I'm having to deal with is convincing CCAs to write statements when management shits on them because they're afraid of management retaliation. But that's its own grievance. That's its own issue. And that's even potentially an equal employment opportunity grievance. And there's consequences to that stuff. And I, look, I get it. If you're a CCA, management controls your schedule. They can really mess with you in a lot of ways that the union can't do very much about. But man, man, I would encourage you, please, please file those documents. And for God's sake, if you're a full-time regular, document that shit. What are they going to do to you? You still get that eight hours every day and that 40 hours every week. And if they start screwing you out of overtime, you get it back at the end of quarter equitability grievance. So you shouldn't have a lot to fear. And again, the worst thing that's going to happen is that management is just going to keep abusing you. And if you just sit on your hands and you keep taking it, they're going to keep doing it. So you have to build that paper trail. You have to document it. And wherever possible, you want to get supporting statements from other carriers. Oh, when we're filing that grievance, and it's not just your word, it's like five carriers all saying that this is what happened and they all have the same story. That is so helpful in establishing what really happened. You know, then it's not just your word against the supervisor. Now it's all these carriers saying this is what happened. And, oh, that really paves the way. So please encourage your coworkers to write those statements as well. And uh, I'm going to go off the rails a little bit with this one. We are not supposed to do any kind of recording at work. But I will tell you, record it anyway. You know, if that management starts abusing you and you have a way to like subtly turn the recorder on on your phone, record it. It's been used successfully in abuse cases in the past. And, you know, ultimately you have that recording. Maybe you don't do anything with it. Um, but the union can decide whether they want to use that recording to make their case. And if they decide not to use it, fine. No harm, no foul. Um, you know, probably try not to be obvious about it. Maybe I should... I don't know. It's a tough one. Um, but I know that it has, those recordings have been used to document, you know, management's abuse. And I think there's a reasonable case to be made that like, you know, this management, this supervisor has been lying about his own behavior. What other choice do I have in order to prove the way he's actually talking to us? So I say record it, but you know, my ideas are my own. All right. Um, Next, don't stoop to their level. You know, if they're the asshole, make sure they're the only asshole in the building. They're going to talk in a bad way to you. Don't talk back to them in the same way. Don't escalate. Don't yell at them. It's just going to make your position worse because now they're going to have documentation of the stupid shit that you said to them, and now they're not the only asshole. And it's a lot harder to win that argument when you're just as much of an asshole as they are. So... You know, there's the standard, I'll do the best I can. And that's it. You know, you can ask them for instructions. Well, what do you think I can do to improve? What do you think I should be doing differently? What what advice do you have? You know, put it back on them. Make them do their job. Uh, I have a brief story about that. There was a carrier I trained many, many moons ago who was very heavy. And heavy enough that it was difficult for this carrier to walk. Uh, generally, let alone the like 12 miles that my route was at the time. And so I trained the carrier and the carrier was really good. Um, had a great attitude, was a pleasure to work with, really picked it up well. But physically, the job was going to be difficult for this carrier. And so I told management after the training was over that, hey, this is the difficulty this carrier is going to have. Can you please work with them? Um, to try to kind of ease them into the physical demands of the job. Unfortunately, at my station, there's a lot of walking routes, and the supervisor said, no, that carrier is going to have to sink or swim, and they're going to have to figure out how to do the job. So after a few weeks, maybe it was a month, whatever, I check in with the carrier, and hey, you know, how are things going? And this carrier says, I'm really worried about getting fired. I, I'm still on my probation, and management keeps giving me a hard time about how long it's taking, and it really was taking this carrier a long time on these walking routes. Um, and I'm really worried I'm going to get fired. And, you know, what should I do? And I said, um, well, you got to go to management and put it back on them. And 
tell them, hey, I think I'm doing the job the right way. I'm doing the best I can out there. If there's something that you think I should be doing differently or something you think I can do to improve, let me know what it is. And that puts the burden back on management. And that accomplishes two things. First of all, management's not going to get out from behind the desk and go follow this carrier and actually give the carrier instructions for how to get better. That's pretty unlikely. And the second thing is they're not going to tell the carrier that you're too heavy to do this job. That is not going to fly. And so we'll put management on the spot. And what, um, what management did, well, from my perspective, that carrier just disappeared. And I said, oh, shit, did they actually fire that carrier? That, that, that sucks. That carrier was really good and had a good attitude and was a pleasure to work with. And a few months later, maybe six months later, that carrier came back. And what management had decided to do was to send that carrier to another station where there was a lot of um, centralized delivery. And so it wasn't as physically demanding. And that carrier made it all the way through being a CCA and is now career and is thriving and it's awesome because the carrier put the burden back on management. Hey, if you think that I can be going faster out there, tell me how. Tell me what you think I'm doing wrong. You know, it puts them on the spot and puts the burden on management, which is exactly where it belongs. So getting back to this abuse, don't escalate. Don't argue with them. Don't go back and forth. If it goes back and forth more than once or twice, you know, you make your case, they say they're bullshit. Then you address their bullshit, and then they say they're bullshit again. You're not just going to keep going back and forth. That's not going to get you anywhere. Your next step is to go to the union. Hey, let's get the union steward over here so we can get this worked out. Because, again, if things get heated, you go back and forth. Well, now there's two assholes instead of just one, and we want to keep it at one asshole. The one asshole is the supervisor, and that's it. So that's my recommendations for how to deal with verbal abuse. You know, ultimately your best defense is knowing how to do the job the right way. And when you do that, when you have that confidence, their bullshit can go in one ear and out the other and you just keep doing your job and you know that you're untouchable. So with all of these topics, you know, the, the takeaway is the same. I said in the beginning of the episode, knowledge is power. The more you know the easier it is to deal with management, the easier it is to make your way and to ignore them and to know that you're doing the right thing. If you think about that uncomfortable feeling you get when management's standing behind you, similar to like when a cop is following you and the cop knows all the traffic rules and, oh my God, what am I forgetting to do? Well, the job, you know, there's some, some basic stuff that, that these things are the reason this podcast exists so that you know these um, the rules, you know, the proper way to do things so that when management does follow you, when management does stare at you, you know how to defend yourself. You know, the right things to do. That's the whole reason I do this podcast, because as the tagline says, I want you to make yourself discipline proof. All right. That's all I have for today. Thank you for listening. Oh, that wound up being a long one. Um, I will, uh, I will catch you next time. Uh,